Jenny, I am really excited to talk to you today. I'm so pumped. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Good. I've been I've been waiting for you. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> so I want to talk about you in particular, but I also want to talk about this amazing company and brand. I mean, it really is just a beautiful brand. Thank you. That you have cultivated. And there is a lot of history to this brand, even though it hasn't been, a, I mean, it was launched in 2014. Yeah. But there's a lot to it. Yeah, there's so, a lot there. Yeah. So let's start at um, maybe the beginning because historically I know that, you know, you did this very intentionally knowing it was going to be a lot of hard work yeah. on the front end. So maybe take us back to the beginning. What initiated this idea of fawn design and like the beautiful line you have now, it started out with one bag, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's take us crazy. back to the beginning, January 2014 or even before. Yeah, so I actually got the idea to do the diaper bag um, a little bit before January 2014 when mm -hmm. we officially launched our, our business, yeah. right? Um, I had a friend who was pregnant and um, she was telling me she couldn't find a diaper bag that she liked and she was just going to use, you know, some nylon backpack because, you know, she didn't want to carry any of the other diaper bags. and. At the time, I was like, I feel like I could make her something cool. Um, I was pretty newly married, didn't have any money, knew I couldn't buy her a gift. So I'm like, I'll make her a bag. And um, I actually like love to sew, I've sewn since I was five years old. So for me, the, the sewing part has always been like the fun and the easy part. So I went home that night after hanging out with these friends and did some drawings and different things. and. And after like a month, settled on kind of this half circle shape design that is unique to Fawn Design mm -hmm. and um, started making little kind of prototypes, if you will, for these bags, obviously with the intention of I'm just making this for one person. But um, finally, you know, decided to do faux leather because it was clean. You could clean it. It's not very expensive, but it looks really nice. Um, and I went and you know bought some faux leather and made her this bag and gave it to her at her baby shower and at the baby shower there were a bunch of women there who were like oh my gosh like I want one of those and they're like can you make me one and I was like yeah I guess I guess I can make a few more and then it just kind of slowly progressed where you know I'd get a random message on Instagram of like hey I ran into so-and-so who said you made her one of these bags can you make me one and um my husband was like, we should like do something with this. And I was like, no, this is just a little, just a little hobby. You know, we're yeah. working, we're going to school. And he was like, no, let's just like, let's make like a website. So he made on Weebly. I don't even know if Weebly is still around, but made this website. <laughs> and, you know, and we just like, I'd post on my personal Instagram, like, hey, I'm, I have 10 more bags if you want to go and buy them. And they'd sell out right away. Like people would buy them and then I'd make them. Um, and mail them to them and then just kind of kept doing that. And it started to get to a point where it was just like, it just wasn't fun to be sewing the same thing over and over again. You know, they're, you know, mass producing, right. Isn't super creative. And so I just kind of was getting burnt out. You know, I was working full time at another job and coming home and sewing till three, four or five in the morning, getting up and doing it again. Mm -hmm. Did that for almost a year. And I was kind of like, I'm, I'm over it. And, you know, my husband was like, we really need to get these manufactured. Like people clearly want them. And I was like, I don't know that, that seems pretty risky. And, but I'm like, okay, let's look into it. And we started looking into manufacturing and things like that. And we knew we needed like $20,000 and, you know, we're living in my parents' basement. I barely found out I was pregnant. So to find twenty thousand dollars, yeah, no way. Short period of time. And I remember, you know, we went into a bank to be like, "Is there any way we can like get a loan?" Like, I've made like a hundred bags. <laughs> this is what we've sold, and they were super nice, but they're like, "No, <laughs> <laughs> like you don't have any sales." So we were kind of like, "Well, what do we do?" So we took out like five credit cards, and we're like, "Okay, well, we'll put you know this much money on this one, this much money on this one," and we had kind of a moment where we're like, this is actually like really irresponsible. We're about to bring a baby in the world with like $20,000 in credit card debt, living in my parents' basement. And so we we were like, why don't we try Kickstarter? Like, why don't, you know, we I didn't know a ton, of, a ton about it, um, but we were like, this could maybe be a good route, right? Where we can 
say the money we need, sell bags as a pre-order, mm-hmm. and then if enough people don't buy it, then we don't we don't take any of that risk and they don't lose any money. And so within like a month, we launched a Kickstarter campaign at the end of December in 2014. And it was super successful. Yeah, thankfully. So we our goal was to raise $25,000 in a 15-day campaign, and we ended up raising just over $42,000. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when we talk about kind of pivotal moments in business, that was like my first one where I was like, okay, not only do I now have this money to manufacture, but I have this validation that people besides my mom and grandma actually want the bag. Um, and so that's kind of where fawn really like as far as a business like happened as opposed to just being kind of a little hobby that made not really any money but love it and you in particular i mean the fawn design is you know what it is whenever you see one of your bags you know yeah like and obviously that was intentional right well i i can't really say it was but it's now as we expand we always are like how do we incorporate the half circle or the rounded Mm -hmm. shapes and things. Um, I wish I could take credit of like, oh, that was totally on purpose, but it was more of I knew just my personality. I liked, I like to stand out. I like to be unique. And so I didn't want to do something that everyone else was doing. And I, that's so important to me today of, you know, there's a million other handbags, diaper bags, you know, but I'm like, I, that's great. But I want to be, I want to be fawn. I want to be Jenny. I want to be very different right and it I mean it comes across as a luxury brand and it doesn't have to be a diaper bag like yeah. it would be something that anyone could to, could wear around totally it would be very functional I mean certainly with all the pockets inside and just the the way that you've organized that yeah I love hearing that because we look part of the you know kind of design process and now as we refine things we we don't really even call it a diaper bag as much anymore because mm-hmm. we have so many customers who don't have kids or who are out of that stage of life and they just love that it's a, it looks nice they're not paying through the nose for it but it has all the function and cleanability that you'd want in a diaper bag which then makes it a great diaper bag too yeah so moving into this I mean it was a happy accident really mm-hmm. is what you're telling me but you did have aspirations um at one point you <laughs> dreamed of being either a fashion designer or a paleontologist yeah I don't I don't know how quite this, a contrast yeah. there <laughs> Yeah, you know, though, it's really interesting when I reflect on my younger self of, I obviously, I love doing creative things and sewing and, you know, always excelled in art class and didn't do very good in math class, but still want to be a paleontologist somehow. But um, I, I really, though, grew up didn't feeling like I would do a whole lot. And I just, you know, thought I would kind of go a very typical route, not not go to college and just, you know, kind of do a minimum wage job and have kids or whatever not saying you know but for me I just never thought I would really do much more than kind of what society maybe thinks I should do and so honestly for me you know obviously from a business standpoint it's amazing but even on a personal level to just see what like I've been able to do and that there's so much more for me than I ever dreamed of Mm -hmm. and that you know I, if I wanted to be a paleontologist right now, I, I could. Like, I feel like I've accomplished stuff that I, I could go and do that. And Absolutely. It's, I don't know, it's really nice to, to have that. Yeah, it's this nice mix of you went where kind of, like, you were going with the mm-hmm. flow, but it was also at some point, I mean, you you turned into this this business mind. Yeah. Because I know we work with you here, and mm-hmm. we have a team, and so we're we're a huge fan like we talk about fawn design just it's such a beautiful and fun brand to design with to just to be creative around but then they talk about you in particular how you are dialed you know your craft and to go from well I wasn't ever planning on maybe launching a brand (laughs) to like you know your stuff so maybe for those watching this and thinking well I might have a good idea or but maybe I'm, I'm not I don't consider myself this business mind right out of the gate. Like, what was your process for getting there? I think it really took, uh, obviously, a lot of time and really just, I do a lot of reflecting, right? Where I, that's why I like doing things like this, where I can talk about fawn design in 2014 and, you know, fawn design right now, because Mm -hmm. it's obviously so different. But to look at the growth 
as a business and as a person, but to always keep going back to that, to like remember your roots, remember why you're doing what you do. Um, and then that for me allows me to have some confidence of like, you know, even six months ago, right, you didn't know anything about this and now you're almost an expert on it, right? Because you spent so much time and I love that thought of like remembering your roots because then that helps you realize like, wow, I'm, I'm actually know what I'm doing even mm -hmm. though you think you don't you you know more than you actually do and so I love yeah. that we were just talking about that yesterday the part where like the more information you get the more you realize like what you didn't know previously and that keeps you so aware yeah of always scanning and like learning so how do you absorb new information I'm really big on first of all like setting your intention for the day like I'm a big believer in meditation and journaling and that mm -hmm. sort of thing um the miracle morning I feel like everyone's read that yeah but it's but that <laughs> the like savers. when I read that book you know a few years ago I, it like hit me like a ton of bricks of like you have to set your day on on how you want to do the day you know and how and to manage the chaos and so that's one way that I feel like it like sets the tone and then allows me to have conversations with people that are smarter than me and instead of just being kind of like falling asleep and but like taking notes and I'm a big note taker I'm always have a notebook or my phone and I'm constantly writing down things people are saying to me and going back and reflecting on them in that time where I'm maybe journaling or whatever but obviously big with podcasts and just books I'm I'm one of those people I'm like I'm a sponge I just like want to learn everything and I've actually decided um to go back to school I never finished college which my husband's like so when are you planning on doing that? And I'm like, I'll figure it out. Yeah. I'll find time. And he's just, he knows though, don't get in Jenny's way because she'll, <laughs> she's going to do what she's going to do. So, but that's to me is I'm like, I just want to learn everything so much. But I think taking that time to really take notes, but then process everything and then, mm -hmm. then try and make a plan of action to apply it, apply it. That's like super, like I try and kind of go in that um, stage, but you know. It's not, I'm not perfect, but I feel like the more I'm willing to take that time to actually listen to people, write it down, and then process it, like, you end up learning some new tricks and mm -hmm. being just smarter and more educated. Yeah, being open. Um, I do the savers. I've done the savers yeah. like Miracle Morning uh, for years. And while I've talked to a lot of, you know, thought leaders, they all talk about their morning routine. Yeah. They may not talk about like Miracle Morning. I For think sure. you're the first who's mentioned Miracle really? Morning. But we all read it. We all, let's I be honest. I think we all read it. Yeah. <laughs> it's out there. But like those morning savers, that's where I, I know I'm just super dialed if I yeah. just do that and create that habit. Now, in terms of you've grown a ton, I mean, Fawn Design, it's, it's such a social brand. Like your Instagram following is huge. Um, you get a lot of engagement there. But what were some of the hiccups along the way? Oh, that's always like the question, right? Like, where do we where do we start? Let me get out that notepad page, right? Um, you know, and I, I know it's kind of cliche of like, oh, but, you know, I've made mistakes, but I've learned so much. And that really is like, you hear that and you're like, yeah, but when you're actually living that, you don't look at it, you don't, I almost don't like the word mistake or hiccup because you're like, man, but it really wasn't because I just learned something I couldn't have learned. But, you know, we've obviously like made not very good hires, we've done bad, you know, lost money on deals that we probably shouldn't have done or trusted people we shouldn't. And, um, you know, there, I kind of a couple of big things that I'm like, oh, that's really standing out to me. Mm -hmm. I wish it was something I feel like I could talk about without, you know, ruffling too many feathers. But, I think the biggest thing is just I've learned is to just trust your gut because there are so many times where I think for me as a CEO, it's hard when I'm going to so many different people for advice, right? And they're telling me to do this and they're telling me to do that and to then have to then decide what's the right thing to do. And I feel like, okay, this person though, they're so much smarter than me and they told me to do this, but my gut doesn't like it, but I'm, I'm going to go with them. And every single time I've, I've not gone with my gut, I've always regretted it and you know something's you know there are times obviously it doesn't go terribly wrong but some of my biggest failures have been because I I didn't I didn't go with my gut and mm -hmm. um and I think that's really important to remember of like there's nothing wrong with getting advice and feedback but at the end of the day you need to feel 100% good about the decision you're making and then even for the mistakes I've made I've tried really hard though to own it 
and not just be like, oh, you know, well, so-and-so told me to do that. Because ultimately, I made that decision. And I think owning it and owning it to your team, um, that's been hard, right, to go, we did this thing a few months ago, and it actually was a disaster, and it's my fault. But this is what we what I've learned. This is what we're going to do to fix it. Here's our plan. Let's go get it done. Um, that's been something that's been really hard for me, but I've noticed a huge um, just amount of respect that I feel like my team has gained for me. If they're like, Jenny's not above us. She's not better than us. She's willing to admit when she's made a decision that we all actually probably didn't agree with, but she's, you know, she's the boss. She can do that. So um, I, yeah, there's some things that I, now, if, you know, if I started another business, I'd be like, definitely not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> not talking to that person, but um, yeah, but you're just, you're grateful for them. You know, you're glad. I feel like too, what's been, nice is the timing right of these mistakes that you've had I feel like I always find myself saying man I'm so glad I learned that now or even reflecting of like can you imagine if that happened now that would have been catastrophic or whatever Mm -hmm. but yeah especially as you gain more momentum yeah I, I can't remember who I was talking to but he mentioned specifically that there is a benefit to not having a lot of visibility no seriously like when you're initially starting out because mistakes will happen it's a natural part of it And it's refreshing to know that it does happen because overnight success is usually several years in the making. Well, I just thought of something. So when we first started manufacturing, like our first two rounds of manufactured bags were terrible. Like, like they looked good, but the, like the durability and the reinforcing terrible. Mm -hmm. So like we had made no money, right? Because we put it all into this manufacturing and, you know, people's backpack straps were ripping out right or it was crazy right and I just remember being like we're done yeah we're done like there's nothing we can do about this and ultimately though I'm like no because like the kind of person I am I'm not I'm just not willing to be like you're on your own like sorry it didn't work out and so I decided right then and there we're going to replace every single bag that has a problem or we'll refund them even Mm -hmm. though you know from a financial standpoint it's like how, how are you planning on doing that you know but I just knew I'm like, we got to make it right if we're going to keep doing this. And that is something that to this day, four years later, I've had people come up to me like, I bought one of your first bags and, you know, the backpack shop ripped out and you personally emailed me and sent me a new one or refunded me or whatever. And that what's crazy is so at the time, right, I'm thinking, oh, Fawn's dead, (laughs) you know, but now it's been something that we obviously learned from and new steps we needed to take from a manufacturing standpoint. But even just from our customers and our followers that have followed us all this way, they, like, remember that. And that's something that they're like, well, Fawn will take care of us if something happens. And, like, that to me is, like, I'm so glad that happened in a way, you know? It's, it's awesome. Yeah. I think that resonates with consumers. It's not a picture-perfect experience. It's what you do when something happens mm-hmm. that you take care of them. Yeah. I think they're that much more invested in you. Yes, yeah, totally. Just human nature is... I don't think any of us expect fully everything to go right. Yeah. Um, if it does go right, you don't think too much about the yeah, experience just, other than, oh, that was a good experience. Yeah. But if something goes wrong and then this company shows that they care, there's empathy, there's, totally. of course, correction that was particular to them, that's a game changer. Oh, and it, I feel like that's a huge thing that set us apart from competitors, right, is that that principle is still the core of Fawn and our customer service is like if – if something's our fault, if there's a defect thing, we no questions asked, we take care of it. Or, you know, anything that fell on fawn, we and even if it doesn't, a lot of times like we send out bags and refunds and things that we maybe shouldn't, but like to me it's so much more important of we have to take care of the people taking care of us. Right. So and you have to be intentional with that decision because mm-hmm. like you said, there is a financial aspect of it. Yeah where, you know, financially it probably isn't great to be refunding things that are maybe on the line, but overall brand and the longevity of Mm -hmm. your brand, you're, you're doing a lot for that. Totally. That's important. Now, in terms of, um, you, your husband is still part of the business and then you have, do you have one child? I have, you have two. two children now. I have two two children in that mix. Okay. Somehow, not. I mean, I know how, but you know how the timing. I'm like superwoman. Uh. Yeah, because um, I can't imagine launching a company at a time where either you're pregnant or just had a baby, and then 
doing that again, but you mentioned in some of the information that you knew that it was worth leaning into. So tell me more about that thought process. Yeah. Well, I think I just, too, being like the consume, like I'm my consumer, right? And so it's also like I look at the time of like, oh, I had these two kids and it was crazy. But I also think it was so essential to help me know where I needed to take the brand and the things I needed um, needed to do. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I look back at those times, like how, like, when were we doing that? And it's actually, it's interesting because, so my husband started it with me. We both were kind of working. He then quit his job to come on and work with me. I think that was probably around three years ago. And that was like a huge, like, oh my gosh, we're going to lose insurance. But we, we just, Interest. we just knew they were like, we'll figure it out. Even if it doesn't work out, we'll figure it out. Um, but that was a scary step for us, obviously. And we just had our, our first child and she was like two weeks old and he quit. Um, but once we did that though, we, I feel like our growth just like, just crazy overnight, literally, because I was finally giving stuff for him to do so that I could focus on the brand and the social media and not be shipping orders or doing things like that. Um, but it obviously was totally super scary, but then we got pregnant, um, I don't like to say on accident because obviously that's not how it is, but (laughs) unplanned, right? A little of a surprise. And kind of at that moment, I was like, well, now we have two kids and this business. We've got to like make a change. And so after a few months, my husband actually kind of stepped down. He's still, you know, co-founded the company with me, but he's full-time stay-at-home dad with our two kids. And because he, from day one, has always been the one like Jenny... Jenny knows font design. I'm just here to help. Like, mm-hmm. so it's been it's been really really awesome actually, um, and I'm super lucky that he's willing to do that, right? Because in society, you know, to be the stay at home dad, there's not a lot of stay at home dads, and but he loves it, and he feels like I'm allowing Jenny to do what's best for our family and what's best for her, and he says it it makes him feel so good to watch me be so successful and knowing that us being a team effort and not necessarily in the workplace, but that allows me to do that. Um, So I feel like when we kind of came to that decision where he's like, you just do your thing, it's even more, more growth, just more than I ever imagined. And so kind of even going back to that, seeing my potential, that was really one of those moments of like, man, I I really do know what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, other people around me see it. I just need to like look in and see it. It is so interesting and really cool because I've interviewed quite a few thought leaders and like masters within their field and many of them have mentioned the support of their significant mm-hmm. other as being pivotal. It's either their their stay at home yeah. parent, but then they're also that sounding board oh, yeah. and that advisor and that that perspective that's kind of opened because it's mm-hmm. not as involved in the daily activities of maybe the workload that's been really valuable. And we interviewed Karen Peterson. She's the CMO at Brainstorm. Oh, yeah. And she said, I never expected to be the same situation where her husband decided to be a stay-at-home dad. She said, "I this wasn't planned. Yeah. You know, it was never part of the plan, but it was this, this circumstance that now we're looking at it as perfect. No, yeah, truly. For our situation, but... It's that same. It's like she's like that support is just as important as my team here at the companies that mm-hmm. I'm running. Yeah, we always we say in our house, you know, when one of us maybe is like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I like dropped the ball on this or that," and we always say we're a team. We have the same goal, even though we're doing two different things. If you don't, if you don't take care of our kids, then I can't go to work and do what I need to do. And if I don't go to work, we can't pay. You know, it's just as very much we try and remind each other. Not one of us is above the other. We're just as essential, and we are a team. We stayed up last night till probably midnight talking about, you know, work stuff, family stuff, but ultimately at the end of the conversation, we're like, I'm so glad that we, like, this is our team, and this is what we're doing. Yeah, like the CEO of the family. Yeah. I mean, it really is a thing. Now, in terms of, you know, your leadership style, you have a team, you have a great team, now, has your leadership style evolved? Totally. Tell me about that. I, it's, so as a kid, I was pretty bossy. <laughs> I was leading the pack. 
But then I also was like really insecure. So it's kind of like a contradiction, right? Um, and so kind of in high school, middle school, I started to kind of lay low a lot more, kind of kept to myself. Um, and then this business has really made me have to kind of like, you know, step up. And as I started to bring people on it, it started to be really hard because I'm like, I don't, I'm 20, you know, I'm 24 or 25 or 26. Who am I to tell this, you know, 35 year old what to do? It was really hard for me. Um, and I think finally, once I just felt comfortable in my own skin and doing a lot of personal development and things and being like, no, I, I, I am like, I am the CEO. I took all this risk, you know, like I have done a lot, but I do need a team. Like I can't do all this alone. And so I think a big thing I think of every single day is how do I bring my, you know, frontline employees to think bigger picture, you know, cause that's, you know, I'm always thinking so far ahead to the point where I have like anxiety, right. And that, you know, take medication for it because I'm always thinking like, where's Fong going to be in five years? And, but to try and get, you know, those employees to go, okay, I know right now you're dealing with this, but let's think, how are we going to tackle this in a month or Mm -hmm. in two months? Um, I think that's a big thing I've had to learn of like, you, you have to bring people to your level. You have to. And I think sometimes as being the boss and the leader, right? We, we don't do it intentionally, but we we want to be the smartest person in the room. So I almost feel like we hire people that know a lot, but really you want to hire people who know more than you. So and that's something that we do. I'm always like, I want someone who knows way more about this than me. I know the things I'm good at and the things I know. Let's get, you know, and it's expensive to do that, but it's so much more worth it in the long run. But then I also think putting people in places that you know they're going to excel, mm-hmm. right? Because I know for me, I want to be doing the things for Fawn that are going to be the best. And I think, too, when you're kind of a startup, just starting, it's hard because you want everyone to wear so many hats, which that is necessary. But I also think to remember that that might not be good for that person and that might make them hate their job. And that's not what we want. Um, so I think really seeing the things people are good at, putting them in a good a good spot, but then the other biggest thing that I know I've, I know I've gotten so much better at is just being direct. Like, you know, I hate this. I hate the term. It's, it's not personal. It's business. I literally hate anytime someone says that to me because I'm like, but you're working with people. So it is personal. Right. But I get the whole point of it. it's like you can't take things personally when it's a very direct, you know, this is a very clear thing. We have the data. We have the proof. But um, but I think taking out that personal side and you don't have to be a jerk, but just to say, this is what I need from you. This is when I need it by here's why. And that why thing, you know, some people are like, well, I don't need to tell people why, but I know for me when growing up, when someone would, you know, my dad would say, you know, you have to do this, Jenny. And my, my reply would always be like, well, why? And he would say, because I said so, because I'm the dad, right? Rightfully so. But my personality, I would have done so much better if he would say, well, this is why. Yeah. This is why I think, you know, and I feel that same way with my employees of I want someone to explain it to me. I want someone to tell me why that's important. And then that helps me going forward of, oh, remember Jenny said this is why we do this. So now I don't have a problem doing it. Or even if it's not my favorite thing to do, I can see the bigger picture. Um, so I think being direct, having those hard conversations, just not beating around the bush and just I was talking to you earlier about kind of my my alter ego right Jenners Jenners. put your Jenner (laughs) pants on and go have a real hard direct conversation and the funny thing is though and I think everyone relates to this you you feel so much better after and it goes so much better than you think it's going to go you always think you know everything's going to go to crap but you you find so many people are actually thinking a similar thing and then it's a very collaborative conversation but just going in with the mindset of I'm not beating around the bush. I'm just getting to the, so I've had to do that. It's t- taken me a long time, but I, I finally do feel like I've made some improvements in that department. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know why it's so uncomfortable. It's just human nature. Yeah. I think to avoid the crucial conversations or the critical, like hard yeah. conversations. But I mean, we just read radical candor where they talk about I love that criticism book. in the workplace is valuable and needed and necessary. So to demonstrate that from mm-hmm. the top down to accept that as well is important. But I also think it's just kind. 
Yeah, it's kind totally. to be direct to remove any confusion or yeah. you know any any opportunity to misinterpret because ultimately if they come back to you, I think most employees they'd be grateful. Yeah, they're like you just gave me a direct path and maybe you are open with them and how they mm-hmm. achieve that goal based on you know their skill set or kind of their superpowers yeah. then the end result though. I love that book. I've read a lot of books this year and that if anyone asks me like best book this year, Radical Candor, is it hands down? Mm-hmm. And it's helped me so much with leading a team of knowing that like because you 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 do care about your employees, you care about their personal lives, but then you enable them by putting them in positions that they 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 aren't maybe qualified for, they're uncomfortable doing. Um, like why when you think of it that way, you're like, why would you do that to them? But you're thinking you're helping them. So, I mean, from a leadership standpoint, that book is, I'm like, everyone read that immediately. Because I know that's a big thing that helped me make that shift and and let go of people that I'm like, I think you're great as a person. I want what's best for you. And because I want what's best for you, font design in this position is not a good fit for you. Mm. And it's given, it's given me that confidence, right, to know that I'm actually doing them a favor. Oh, absolutely. Because you know? the next thing might be the perfect fit for them. Yeah. And they'll think, all right, Jenny or Jenners had it, <laughs> had it so right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, to go back and be grateful for that. Now, in terms of my last question, it's a question I ask everyone. It's, it's a big question, but it's in terms of your legacy, what do you, Jenny or Jenners, what do you want to be known for? The first thing that always comes to my mind is like that I'm a person of integrity. Um, that's huge to me. Mm-hmm. That I always, it's so easy in business to blur those lines, right? And to step on toes and to do things. And that's just not me. That's not the kind of person I want to be, even if it is to make more money. It's it's sometimes hard for me within my business because I have so many people like, well, where do you want Fawn to be in in five years? And I'm like, well, Like, what do you, do you mean like from a money standpoint? And it's always like, yeah, what's like your sales goals? And I'm like, I have to really work with my CFO because he's like, Jenny, if you're going to make a successful company, you've got to have some number driven goals. Mm -hmm. It's really hard for me because obviously money's great. Money pays the bills. And, but that's not why I do what I do. Um, I think for me, bigger picture with Fawn is, and why I started it to begin with is, you know, I want women to have a bag or community or product or whatever it is that makes them feel a little bit better about themselves, you know, and that they feel like they're not alone. I know for me as a mother, obviously I've had all this chaos with my business, but I totally gone through like an identity crisis of who, who is Jenny anymore? I, you know, I know who Jenny was before I had kids. And I even went through this period where I was like dressing super weird. And my husband even said something like, what are you doing? You know? And I, and I just remember being like, I'm just, I'm just trying to fit in. Like, I'm trying to, like, be the mom, right? And he's like, you look so uncomfortable, you know? So I finally decided, like, two years ago, like, I'm going to wear my jeans, my Vans, and my button-up shirts. And, like, that's what I wear every day in some variation because that's what I feel comfortable in. Um, And I want to, like, preach that to every woman, mom or not, that, like, own who you are, be comfortable in your own skin. And, yeah, maybe Fawn Design is is helping you get there or feel inspired or, you know, we're really going to be focusing on our blog this, this next year of it just being its own kind of separate community so that women in general, like we don't feel so isolated and we feel like there's people that we can connect with. And that to me is way more important than any dollar amount ever. And it always, I know it always will be, but you know, I also know that with, with operating from a place of integrity and, and putting those things first, the money will come. That's just how it goes, you know? So I'm not I'm not really worried about that, but I think, you know, being a person of integrity, giving back and just creating that community is like, that's what I want to be remembered for, for sure. That's a great story. And you're doing it. Like, I, I didn't think about the community part, but you're so right. Like, you are your own customer. Yeah. So that benefits the... The things that people need to hear, the yeah. things that you know will resonate. Totally. With some, maybe a new mother. Yeah. Or a mother who's been at it for many, many years. And totally. it's like, I don't feel like my identity yeah. is mine anymore. Yeah. And I love the thought of, because I've had customers say to me, like, I feel like, I feel like the cool mom. 
with my back. It's pretty cool. And that that alone can like carry them to like maybe the next thing that they're yeah. like, you know what? I'm going to go get a blowout yeah. today yeah. because <laughs> that would make me it. feel really, yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Thank you so much for sitting down. I This has been such a fun conversation. I loved it. Thank I, you so much. Yeah. So until next time, because I could see us doing a part two. Let's do it. Okay.